trade associations create a very special, specific, professional community. And it's a community. And it's a community of support. Hi, George. I was wondering if you could take a minute and uh, introduce yourself. Sure. My name is George Southworth. I'm executive director at the Flavor and Extract Manufacturers Association. Welcome to Owning Your Legacy. Thank you very much. I think um, it's really a pleasure uh, to be here because um, you and I, Madam President, I should be calling you. Oh, yes. Um, I need a crown. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, iconic time. And right. uh, it's a great opportunity to be here and talk a little bit about myself, um, talk a little bit about some of the trade associations yeah. and work that I've done and the work that we're doing together as well. I love that. Uh, yeah, it is. And we'll definitely have to touch on that. But first, I'd love to have you just tell us your story. My story is one that comes from very humble beginnings. I um, I was raised in a blue collar family um, with not a lot. Um, and I was actually the first person in my family, immediate family, to go to college. Wow. Um, wasn't pushed to do any of that, but I somehow had something inside of me that was driving me to do more and to be more. Mm -hmm. um, so I, uh, I took that opportunity and, and, and went to college and got a degree in political science. Um, and then, you know, where did you go again? I went to Clark University. It's a small liberal arts school in uh, Massachusetts. Cool. Um, it's they, they had a really interesting way of describing their university. They said you can't identify, I think is the way they said it. Uh, I, I identify a person here because they wanted it, everyone to be unique and different. So they really focused on people being um, sort of tapping into their differences I and kind that. of improving them and or acting upon them and or letting them shine or amplify. So more like a strengths, amplify strengths kind of concept. Exactly, nice. exactly. How, how big was it? Really small. Um, there were 500 kids in my graduating class. Wow. So you got to know um, pretty much everyone you went to school with yeah. um, as well as your professors. And that was what was really unique because you hear a lot of stories about people that go to universities where you're in seminars where there's a thousand. Purdue. Oh, is that what it was like? <laughs> there's probably, I think, something like 38,000 38, students when I was there. So, wow. yeah. What a difference that would be. I think that's I mean, my, one of my classes was five wow. students. Yeah. So get to know the professor really well. The hard thing at the big schools is no one knew if you were a class or not, especially freshman and sophomore classes, because those are like the weed out classes. Really easy to just sleep in. <laughs> Dangerously easy to just sleep in. I, I learned I, that lesson. <laughs> I, I had one class that was uh, maybe a hundred students, and I, uh, I I scheduled it during. This is terrible. Um, during during a time where I was really into this one soap opera, so <laughs> I would skip it. Constantly. General Hospital. No, I was a guiding light. Oh, okay, <laughs> I was I was Channel Seven in Chicago, so it was all the General Hospital, and yeah, those were great. <laughs> But yeah, no, it was a great, uh, it was a great uh, school. Um, and, you know, after, after graduating, I really had no idea. I mean, does anyone really have an idea what they want to be? I do not think so. Even when you start school, knowing what major you want. I mean, so yeah. what led you to political science? That's a great question. I think, you know, initially I was really interested in foreign languages. So I'd studied Spanish for a long time. And um, you, I, are you fluent in Spanish? I used to be. I yeah. kind of learned. I kind of forgotten. I can I can understand it, but I just didn't practice it enough. But at right. one time I was. OK, cool. I, I got to study abroad and, and I learned Spanish that way. But um, I chose political science because I thought if I wasn't going to do languages, that maybe I could do something from an international perspective, mm -hmm. and then maybe the Spanish would come in handy there. So um, when I graduated, um, this is a story that I, I think, I don't know if it's unique per se, but I, um, I didn't know what I wanted to do. So I was looking at different places to go, and I had a friend who was living in DC. This was in, I'm, I'm dating myself, in 1992. Um, and it was, there was yeah. during Same the Same year I got out of school, oh, so really? right there with you. Okay. Yeah. And, but I didn't know that. Yeah. I didn't know that. Um, so anyway, I graduated, no job, and a friend of mine was living in, in D.C., and she said, well, why don't you just move down here and sleep on my couch? 
until you find something. And I thought, well, I could wait tables. I did that through college. Um, so this was like on a Wednesday and I hung up the phone and told my parents, um, I'm going to move to DC, uh, on, on Sunday. <laughs> and they were, they were flipping out. And I moved to DC with, I always say this $800 in a pillow. Wow. And slept on a friend's couch. That's very brave. <laughs> very brave. And I'd never been there before either. So I didn't even know what I was getting myself into. And you've been in D.C. ever since? Yes. So 31 years. 31 it's beautiful. Years. It's a beautiful city, though. Especially it is. in the spring. I it think. is. Very much so. Yeah. And so I, uh, I got there and then... Um, was just, I, I figured I could wait tables. I could do something along those lines. And I was really fortunate because I got an internship for a congressman from um, North Carolina. And so I started off opening mail. You know, mm -hmm. I was answering phones. I started from the bottom, mm -hmm. um, which I was really happy, but I was also making $5 an hour. <laughs> and Hard to the, live on that. Exactly. Thank God city. for the couch. <laughs> <laughs> and that just sort of progressed into a career in politics. And um, I was really, really fortunate, because I don't know, I mean, you probably can say this, but I don't know how many people go to college for a specific type of education and then end up doing that in their careers. I think yeah. in the flavor industry, it's, it's probably predominant. Um, in, in the world that I was kind of operating in, it wasn't. Mm -hmm. And I ended up working for a congressman who was on the subcommittee on the Western Hemisphere. And he was doing work, um, both political as well as, you know, helping building orphanages um, in Central and South America. Wow. So I got to travel did down there. Did you get there. to use your Spanish I then? Did. That's I did. Perfect. Yeah. Did you, do you speak, did you oh, learn anything? I language? took five years of Spanish, but I was never, ever anything close to fluent. <laughs> I can read it, but yeah, I would, I would love to do that again someday yeah. though. That would be fun. Yeah. So yeah, I did that for a bunch of years and it was a perfect, it, it was, I, I, it was really kind of exciting to be able to say, you know, I went to college, I studied political science and Spanish and here I am helping to, there was a huge hurricane. I forget what year it was in the nineties that hit Central America. It was called Hurricane Mitch. Uh -huh. And so I was working with local communities to, to, to send over pencils and clothing and all this stuff. Mm -hmm. I say pencils because we were helping schools as well, all over to, um, to Central America to help them with um, the- That sounds fulfilling, you know, like purposeful. And so, yeah. so did you end up liking politics? I mean- That's a great question. You've got all the good questions today. <laughs> well, you're queuing me up perfectly, so thank you. <laughs> I, you know, I- uh, I, you know, I, I, I wasn't sure what my next step was. So by kind of laying out, you know, what experiences I had had up until that period, I found that I was the most passionate and the happiest when I was working for a trade association. And I, and I can give you a number of reasons why, but I, that was when I kind of had this realization that this is where I felt that I could thrive the most. I could do the most. Um, I could do the most for industries that are members of those as associations. So um, that's when I started going. So back what were the? Thing. So I mean, we obviously know FEMA and the Flavor Extract Manufacturer Association where you are now. But prior to that, what were there was two other trade associations. Yeah, I worked for the National Association of Manufacturers, which that's is right one now. of the largest trade associations in the United States. So just to be a manufacturer, are you manufacture anything and you can yeah. be a part of that association? Yeah. Oh, that's one of, I, I, I mean, it's been years since I've been there, but I remember at the time, it's like anybody who makes anything in America. What would that association's like mission be for its members? I mean, in the end, um, it was just, it was ensuring that companies were able to do business in the United States, um, working to ensure that um, that leg there was no legislation that would negatively impede them from doing the business that they were doing. Gotcha. Um, and and you know, maybe does that have anything to do then with, you know, taxing people that are trying to import into the, to, to protect the United States based manufacturers? Sure, sure. There was definitely a, a an aspect to that as well. Mm -hmm. um, I think also it was educating lawmakers. Um, that was a really big part of um, the, the association was 
educating them about, did you know that there are the, this many manufacturing jobs in your state that the in your state manufacturing brings this much revenue back to your state. Mm -hmm. um, it's just impact I, reporting. Yeah, exactly. That's huge. Exactly. You're exactly right. So that was a big part of at least my role there. Um, and what was your role there? Do you were I was in public affairs. Okay. Uh, for the most part, um, I, I changed jobs internally a bit, but it was predominantly public affairs. Um, but um, but yeah, it was really sort of um, we we. We launched a, a program, and it, now the name completely escapes me. But it was a um, a way of bringing in um, legislators into their districts, where we would have sort of town halls, mm -hmm. um, smaller groups, so that they got an opportunity to build relationships with those um, with those manufacturers. Um, because I think the ultimate goal um, for any lawmaker, for that matter, is to really know their constituency. Right. And you know, if they had a question about a particular piece, a piece, a piece of legislation or a bill, that they knew that they could call somebody like you and say, "Hey, you know, I'm 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 looking into this bill. It might be coming to the House floor, or it's being debated within, you know, um, a specific committee. Do you what What are your thoughts? And um, and that kind of communication, I think, is important. Yeah, and that's what makes this country as strong as it is. is right. the communication between a constituent and their and their legislator. I can't say any of them have ever called me. <laughs> <laughs> you should have them, I you know. <laughs> should. I should. That's Yeah, you know, I mean, we've talked about it that I feel like I'm like the opposite of political, you know, I really And I think a lot of it is education. Like I, I feel like I don't get it and yeah. it's, you know, it's just uncomfortable and not really clear to me like a lot of it. And, and you make a good point. I, you, you said earlier, it, it's we we were not we were bipartisan. We are well. When I worked there, it was bipartisan because it's important to educate everybody right. um, about um, whether you're Republican, Democrat, or independent. Um, what how important manufacturing <laughs> is yeah. to the United States, to the U.S. economy, and then just to dive deeper. Um, into what um, what it brings to your state or district, depending mm -hmm. on whether you're a senator or a congressman. And there's not many women in manufacturing, which is interesting. I yeah. mean, we, even with WeBank, the Women Business Enterprise National Council, which I always have to think really hard about that acronym, <laughs> um, that uh, there's a lot of women businesses, but not many manufacturers. It's more not... Um, brick and mortar, maybe marketing and HR services yeah. and things like that. So yeah. I, there, there's, I, I feel like there's an organization in DC and there's always, you know, there's an association for everything and an organization for everything, but this one's really important. I feel like there, there is an organization I can always circle back with you about women in manufacturing. We do have one, um, in Chicago, like in our area here, because I've, I've spoke at it before and it's a, it is a, a strong, um, group. Yeah. So I know my HR woman continues to to go to that. Oh, that's great. Because it, it's powerful for, especially for attracting talent. Yeah, it's important. Mm -hmm. You know, diversity is important, yeah. I think. So then you moved on to that, to the plastics. Was that next? Yes. So after, when I did that reevaluation um, and decided that, you know, figured out that associations were, were, that's where my passion was, I then just reached out to my network in D.C., um, and moved to the Plastics Industry Association. Another, uh, you know, you, you'll find this out. I mean, there's an association for everything, right? Mm -hmm. And I think there is for a reason. Um, just like FEMA, you yes. know, there there are associations for industries to get together and to to um, work together and to um, successfully build a community um, for networking and for professional growth. I think there's the associations offer a lot. And, and what drew me back, most importantly, was that um, the diversity and working with these, um, working for a specific association really allows you, um, or me, I should speak uh, for myself, the opportunity to sort of get a graduate degree yeah. in that industry. Mm -hmm. And who gets that? Right. You know, that opportunity. You probably learned so much about plastics I that you probably never even wanted to learn necessarily, but. Plastic manufacturers are making plastics to be used 
for a number of different reasons, right? It's, it helps with keeping food fresh. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, don't even get me started on how plastics are used in hospitals. I mean, right. it saves lives, right? right? I mean, you don't want your IV bag to be glass. Yes. You know what I mean? It's, yeah. it's, it's, a, it's flexible plastic. Um, so in no way do the manufacturers want that in the ocean. Um, it's, it's unfortunate that it's ended there, ended up there. Um, and really what it, what, it, what it, you know, in my mind, my opinion is that, um, you know, it's important for, for us as a community to ensure that we modernize um, our recycling programs and our um, efforts in education on mm -hmm. recycling. Um, I think that it is a bit of a mystery and it's, we've got some antiquated systems and I think that could help uh, right. prevent these things from happening. Yeah. And you know, there's the a core of that is coming from a few specific countries that don't have an infrastructure at all. Yeah. So it's really important to continue to help grow that, that, infra that, that infrastructure in those countries. And that's again, kind of back to teaching legislators what's important to the constituents you know it's i'm sure there's ways that our country could help those countries for sure agreed agreed yeah and i i believe that there is a group i think businesses have gotten together and have funded opportunities to help build mm -hmm. that infrastructure there and that's association work i was too. just gonna say like as you were talking about the benefits of associations that's exactly it where the all of the member companies can get together and create plans around the betterment of the earth, you know, mm -hmm. and how can we use our power for good? Mm -hmm. You're exactly right. I mean, think about it. You're getting a group of people together that represent an industry and they're innovating because innovation's key. They're getting together and they're, I mean, there's a number of different things that they're doing from an education perspective, um, as I mentioned, professional growth, but yeah, there there inno innovations there, fostering, right. you know, education, fostering opportunities, and that's one of the benefits of of being in an in, in an association. So then, what attracted you to flavors? That's really very interesting question yeah. again, <laughs> Lorette. Um, that's why I have this job. <laughs> <laughs> well, to work with people like you. Yeah. There, oh, you go. there you go. <laughs> I mean, let's be honest, it, it touches every aspect of our lives. Um, and it's really, it's an exciting organization. Um, when, I, uh, when I heard about the opportunity, it was also an opportunity for me to take on a stronger leadership role, which I had not had before. I, um, and honestly, that was news. You were sharing that as we were getting ready to chat with about in this podcast. And I didn't really realize that this, this was such a big jump for you. And that's, it is. Yeah. that's huge. Yeah, I mean, thanks. that's, that's brave. Yeah, too. It is. It's, uh, you know, I've, I've managed people, I've managed programs, I've managed teams, worked with boards, but I've never had been an executive director before. So, you know, there was a part of me thinking, you know, my, my initial tra trajectory, as I mentioned, was Capitol Hill Association, Fortune 500 company and then running their Washington office. I, you know, I had these goals um, in my head that I wanted to to do while I was in DC. And then when that changed and I found my passion working for trade associations, I started sort of reevaluating reevaluating what that trajectory was. Mm -hmm. And that trajectory was to be um, to, to, to work for a trade association, work with its members, help lead the association. And so this opportunity um, came to me and I thought this is, this is too good to be true. Mm -hmm. um, and again, you know, when, when I got the role, um, I, I was again given this incredible opportunity to learn about the flavor industry. Um, but also, I mean, candidly, um, scary, um, because I'm not a spring chicken, but I was up for that challenge. I was up for learning how to be a leader. And I don't know if, is there, there isn't a class for that, is there? No, no, not at all. It's experience. And I think the best growth in our lives happens when we challenge ourselves to, yeah. to 
get out of our comfort zone, which you're doing today. Yeah, I am. You are, and you're doing great. See, it's wow. easy. I told you it was going to be easy. <laughs> I'm like, George, this is, it's just a conversation. It's great. Yeah, it, this, this is new to me, but yeah. I think you're right. I think, you know, if you stay, I mean, for some people, maybe that's where they want to be. Right. Um, and that's okay. Um, for me, I think growth is, it's important. Uncomfortable is important. So, George, I have a question for you. Oh, yeah. How would you advise our listeners that are looking to engage in an association? How would you advise them to pick the right one for them? Because as you mentioned, there's so many and time is so limited for all of us that you mm -hmm. can't, you got to pick a horse, so to speak. Mm -hmm. So where, how would they do that? I, that's a great question. I think it's, it really boils down to, as I mentioned, there is an association for everything. My thought is, is that, um, you know, depending on where you fall um, and find the association that fits the work that you're doing. Um, so for example, um, in, at the Plastics Industry Association, you know, the associations representing um, companies up and down the supply chain. Um, in many cases, um, those com companies may also be members of the American Chemistry Council. Um, I guess it really just depends upon um, where you, where, what you're doing, what industry, um, what association fits the industry that you're, that you're actively participating in. Gotcha. Um, and also, um, you know, what are, what are you looking to do mm -hmm. or get from that association as well? So George, how would you advise listeners on how to maximize the value they get as a member of an association? I think that is the number one question that requires a great answer because I think I look at associations as a two-way street. Um, it's a two-way street because as an association, we are looking, we're helping the industry, we're looking out for the industry, we're sharing information with the industry, we're educating the industry, we're providing opportunities for, um, for uh, association members to professionally grow, um, we're providing opportunities for education, uh, but at the same time, an association, it, this is the two-way street part, you are the ones that are the boots on the ground. Yes. And so you are also sharing with us concerns, you're sharing with us issues, you're sharing with us you know, desires to learn more about X, Y, Z, X, Y, Z subject. And so as an association, it's, it's almost like a give and take. It kind of reminds me of what you were saying about reaching out to us and saying, you know, what is it that you need? Well, we need a webinar on vanilla. Yeah. You know, we need, I've got some new junior flavorists and they need regulatory webinar on just basic 101. Yeah. So it's, it just was reminding me of that comment that you made that it's almost like you have to constantly as the executive director be feeling out what the constituents need. Well, you're exactly right. I mean, I think that that is one of the key benefits of an association is that it provides an opportunity for its for member companies to to network mm -hmm. with with amongst the other members of their industry um, to innovate together, mm -hmm. um, to grow together, and to address these these things that you just referenced. Um, and education. I think I, as you're saying this, I, I've shared this story, I think with you, I'm sure, but I, I know I've said it before, but um, when COVID hit, which was, you know, scary for all of us, there was a couple of Chicago-based flavor companies and probably wouldn't have had the relationship that we have together, you know, and a lot of them family owned or past family owned, but whatever, but without the FEMA relationship, that these relationships would happen. So COVID hit, we're all freaking out about supply chain, about anybody getting sick, about being able to supply. We were all essential, you know, companies that needed to keep manufacturing. And it gives me chills every time I think of this story, but the group of the Chicago companies got together and said, you know, if you need any help supply chain wise, if you're, you know, or if your team gets sick and you need backup guys, like, like who does that? Yeah. Like yeah. that, I loved it. We never had to deploy anything, any of the companies that were in this little conversation here, but but just to know somebody had your back. Yeah. Like that is, especially in that time. Yeah, I hear you. And 
and you know that makes me think of like th there was there was one kind of phrase that always resonates in my head is that trade associations create a very special specific professional community yeah and it's a community it and is. it's a community of support yeah and it's support that you all give each other as, through that example that you shared, which is a wonderful example, mm -hmm. but it's also support that the association gives as well. Right. Um, I think that, um, and, and, you know, that's one of the greatest benefits of, of being and a And I like of what you're saying about the plastics too. It's like the intention is always to do good. I think most industries, particularly the food industry. Yeah. I feel, I feel that, um, you know, as, as, as an association, um, you know, I, I mentioned education and, and, and the like, ultimately the, the, it's all for the greater good of the industry. It's all for the greater good of the employees that you employ. Yes. It's all for the greater good of the revenue that is brought back to the state or it's 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 yeah. demonstrating all of this whether it's to legislators as i explained at the beginning of this um there's a lot of greater good there but definitely and i think i'd love you to talk a little bit about you know is it worth it for member members of member companies to explore leadership opportunities or growth opportunities within an association. So talk about that. When it, when a company joins an association, and this is my opinion as, you know, a leader of an association and one that's had experience, so much experience working in associations, I think you do yourself a disservice when you join an association and you don't plug yourself in as much as you can because there's so much that's being offered um, that is at anyone's any 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 employee of your company, it's at their fingertips yes. to access, to participate in, and I think when you when you talk, uh, I, I like to use the word engagement. Engagement is key. If you are a member of an association, engagement is key because engagement within the association is going to bring all those things that I've been describing to help you grow professionally, personally too. I think. Right. Um, creates a peer network for you, yes. um, but also it helps you grow professionally because one of the things that associations do um, is, as I said, offer educational programming, um, offering you know webinars, in-person meetings, um, where you're walking away with knowledge um, that's just only going to help you and then right. ultimately help your company. Right. Um, and that's all through engagement. And then you, know, you talk about leadership you know, but becoming engaged, you know, I, I look at it as, you know, as a, as a younger person in an industry joining an association, they are learning um, new things. Mm -hmm. um, they're also learning professional things that are helping them um, in their own professional growth. And over time, it gets them to places, I believe, of leadership, not only within their company, um, but also within the association. Mm -hmm. And I think that becoming a leader within an association helps you not only professionally and, and, and personally, but, but, but to be able to share, hey, this is what I'm seeing back at my company or what I'm seeing in the industry, you know, about this specific issue, there needs to be more focus on you know, education on this particular topic. And as a leader, you're a driver, right? You know, and so if you're if if you're in an association, um, and you're not investing the resources, and by resources, I mean, the people, yeah. um, and the time, um, you're missing out, because right. there's a lot of great things that are offered. Um, and when you make that commitment, and it's a small commitment. Mm -hmm. When you make that commitment, it's only goodness. It's only goodness that's coming out of it. Yeah. You know? Yeah, and sometimes it's not even so small of a commitment. I mean, I think when you're talking to the board and, and that kind of commitment, it's a little a little bigger, but, but I, it's also um, of service. I, I like that about mm. associations too, that those of us that are on the board at FEMA, it's, not a paid gig. <laughs> you do it out of service exactly. to the industry and to your yeah. And we we wouldn't be here today uh, without people like yourself 
I like to call you Madam President. Yeah, I'll um, take it. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> but no, seriously, you, you, I mean, you all, I mean, and, and I see this at every association, the volunteers, I mean, let's not forget, this is, yes. this is volunteer. Now, committee chairs that we just learned so much about how busy they are and what agreed. they're doing. And again, that is of service. It, it's of service. Exactly. Mm-hmm. It's volunteering. But they're learning. And like you're saying that. Exactly. It, I, I agree. I think it is worth the effort of any member within the membership companies to to go for it and to really volunteer. And it also just provides you a plethora of different things. They're like little nuggets yeah. that associations have um, that that Sometimes are there. It's like best practices, you know, right, just right. like simple, simple things that you're like, oh, that's cool. Right. Uh, sales navigator. So, you know, like right. just it's just a little thing. But um, yeah, so I think on that note, it's a great um, segue to I'd love to hear more about the FEMA Fly program. Yeah. And, you know, kudos to you um, as, as it is a new program um, that was launched this year. Um, And I think it's really, really important. It stands for the Future Leaders Initiative. um, And it's for newcomers to to the flavor industry um, that are looking to to grow both professionally and and personally. Um, And again, a benefit of of that, of being a part of an association allows you to participate in this type of a program. And, you know, we've launched the program as a way to create a network for people. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we've all been there before. I mean, we right. you were talking about, uh, you know, I was talking about being a new executive director. Um, there are groups of executive directors. Yeah. They don't have an association name, but there are groups. And it's, it's nice to get together with these individuals and sort of talk through problems or to hear. How do you pre- handle this? I, I hugely agree. I'm a part of a like an advisory group that I've been a part of for probably 25 years now. And t- it's small. There's like seven of us. And it's oh, that's a, great. I'm a mentor. You know, we have mentorship, the Sage um, couple that's probably in their 80s, but uh, Warren was past president of Borg Warner. But it's a it's so important to have a circle of advisors that you can go, what do you do about this trouble or this right. concern? Or And the other thing I wanted to touch on with the FLY program which I don't deserve the kudos. It's the membership committee team. I think that came up with this program, right? Which I love. Yeah, our I'm membership not, services committee. Membership, they, so, yeah. they deserve kudos as they, well. They really do. Yeah. I like that it sounds like it's going to um, start as like a cohort. I don't know if yeah. that's the right word. But I that love that. That is the right word. <laughs> I love that word because I remember walking into my first FEMA meeting a long time ago, a good 27 years ago or so. and When you were three. When I was three. <laughs> And it's it, it's uh, overwhelming, you know. You don't know anyone. It's just so having this cohort, and they're going to all be tight. Yeah, that they're going to have each other at meetings, and I think this is going to be really cool. I'm yeah. very excited about it. And you know, you know, and stepping back, I mean, it's it's going to be a group that will grow together. They will have. I mean, I, I kind of look at it as sort of you know uh, going to school with a group of yes. people. Um, and they're learning the industry um, within their companies. Um, but then we at, at, the, at FEMA, um, am, am, we're offering programs for them. We're, we're offering them a variety of different programs. You know, something that may sound simple, but very important are programs like uh, managing or um, uh, public speaking. Yes. You know, we're still we're still kind of going through different types of content, um, but we we also want to be able to use our what I like to call our seasoned professionals, people like you, Lorette, yeah. to come and talk to them about how you mm-hmm. walked through um, right. your career. Yeah, and steps that you've taken. Um, I think that um, as I would say as somebody who would be new to an industry, I think that it that would be a message that would resonate with me. I love that. You know, I think, you know, the goal of any association and, and I think the goal of FEMA through FEMA Fly is to foster and, and I think this is really important, foster stewardship for the next generation. Absolutely. It's hugely important. It's it's exciting to see this get kicked off and um, it's exciting to see what 
I don't know if we want to call them a class. Um, I like that. What they will be, yeah. you know, and I think, um, you know, if I, if I was looking at and myself. we should have like a graduation ceremony too. Yeah, we <laughs> should. Um, but yeah, no, if I, if I had something like that when I was a newcomer, because we're not necessarily just saying young. Right. It's just a newcomer. We yes. don't want to necessarily True. focus yes. solely on, you know. Yeah, age doesn't matter. It's, age doesn't matter. Right. right. And so if I had something like that, I think it would be, it would, it, it, it the benefits would be incredible. And, mm-hmm. and it all goes back. And you're going to get more stepping out for leadership roles because of this class, because they're going to have more confidence to mm-hmm. step into the leadership roles. So that's, that's, and that's what we need. It's back to your. Well, uh, also yeah. to, to what you said, you know, confidence is key. It's, it can be difficult for anybody, whether, you know, FEMA, whether it's plastics, whatever, you know, getting whether it's out a podcast, there. Whether it's podcast, whether exactly. it's that imposter syndrome, exactly. it gets exactly. all of us, it gets all of us and Can't it sneaks, sneaks up on us. But, you know, it does, you, you build that confidence and you feel comfortable with your voice. Yeah. And, you know, the, the, the interesting thing about um, our industry is, and, and this is what I've found as I've gone out to visit because part of my education and I'm still learning is going out and visiting our member companies and and going to the factories and going to the facilities. And there's a couple things that really, really resonate with me about this industry. You know, one is the passion. Yeah. I mean, every time I've walked through um, a factory, I hear from people that are developing flavors and how excited they are because they've created it and it's tangible. I, I can I can touch it. To see it on the shelf, there's nothing more exciting. And to see somebody enjoying. And then it's for me, as somebody who doesn't have this ability, they're using their right side of the brain and their left side of the brain. Absolutely. I mean, it's a unique thing. And you individual. know one of my greatest passions is kids and getting you started out the podcast saying, you know, flavors are in in everything. And I don't know how you felt when you joined FEMA at first, but when you would tell your friends, I think you mentioned this, you tell your friends about it and they're like, flavors, I don't know how many times I have to explain it. What are flavors? And you're like, to just, you know, whatever people you meet. And they're like, well, you eat them every day. and mm-hmm. But there's not enough for awareness I feel of the industry for students. Mm-hmm. So back to your right left brain thing, we have often had STEM students come through Edlong, and um, and I just love when their eyes light up. Of I can have a chemistry degree, but do something artistic with it. Yes, like there's not many things that that you can do that. Right. I don't have to get a chemistry or a biology degree and just become a doctor or right. whatever. You know, it's like there's. Um, a creative outlet and perfume. I mean, that's just beautiful. Right. You know, we can't make cheesy perfume. But I wish you could. I, I wish we could too, because I, I think I would be really be fun. against that. <laughs> <laughs> it'd be really fun. But, but I, yeah. I, I was, I, I was really very. I mean, the the passion that people have for the work that they do, it's it's tangible, and you know, I'm using a pun. It's palatable. Yes. Um, and then the other thing that I that I thought was really interesting was, um, and it kind of goes to with what you just said, um, which is that you know folks go and get like a food science degree or, or, or something along those lines. They may not be um, fully aware of the flavor industry. When they do become aware of it, it's almost as if they've they fall into it or they stumble into it. Absolutely, and then. The interesting thing is they stay. They never leave. That says something. It's an industry that is very family-like. It has a family feel to it. Yeah. Good and bad sometimes, but but definitely a family feel. And I think that is so true. I mean, you've got to have, I mean, to me, it's, 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 it's a, it's a really unique industry. Um, and when people are in it, they're in it forever. And Mm -hmm. And I think they're in it because there's a passion for it. There's a love for it. How important it is, and just and generally nice people. Agreed. Really yeah. nice people. Yeah. I feel like I always say that. And you also commented at your your internship that you had with your eight hundred dollars in DC living on the couch. And I I love internships, and I am passionate about internships because that 
my first one was at Keebler. It's when everything I was learning at Purdue in food science finally made sense. Mm. I was like, ah, oh, it, like it connected the dots for me. Great experience. Still friends with people that I had at that internship, one of my dear friends. Um, but back to associations, I feel, and you know, I feel strongly about this too, but there's an opportunity where we're working with Tuskegee and you can mm -hmm. touch on that a little mm -hmm. bit, but of showing these students, you know, what the food industry looks like. Internships are so powerful. They are. They Either are. You, or you learn what you hate too. Agreed. Which is hugely valuable. Yeah. And when do you get a chance to do that? Yeah. Right? And when we as employers, like tasting and smelling is a God given talent that yeah. not all of us have. And an intern opportunity allows us as employers to say, do they have the God given talent? Yeah. You don't get that on an air interview where yeah, you get it yeah, that's a good point. as well as fitting in with culture and all sorts of really other important things that you learn from an intern. But so, yeah, we had our, our interns this summer, um, stayed here for a week. I'm like, Oh, you guys should go to the Chicago con. They were so excited. They oh, were from great. out of state, you know, so they ended up sleeping on the balcony. Is that not hysterical? Because the weather was so nice. They just loved it. <laughs> they're like, until the trains came at five, they're like, we slept on the balcony. And oh, I'm like, that great. is so cute. And so would, did they all know each other before? No. And they... Um, did they bond? They totally bonded. And this is the first time we've ever done this. They had an Airbnb together, all of them. So one was the shopper, one was the cook. Like they, it, oh, was, that's it could have been like a reality TV series. It should have been, you sure. know? <laughs> should have had the crew there. <laughs> yeah, they were adorable. No, so. I, 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 to step back on, on, um, on the passion and the love and, and the people that stay within it, it, it just... That's one of the things that, you know, uh, we were talking about me being new in the role as executive director and it's a scary place and it's exciting at the same, same time. I'm definitely out of my comfort zone, but there's something comforting. There's something exciting. There's something inspirational about the people in this industry. And as you know, the, the you know, like we all do, mm -hmm. there are days that I'm, that I feel you know, I'm nervous. I'm, I'm, you know, this, this, I'm out of my comfort zone. But you know, when I think about the work and the people that are doing the work, mm -hmm. it's really. I mean, if you want to talk about passion, I mean, True. I talk about passions for passion for trade associations. I mean, again, that passion's incredible. And mm -hmm. I mean, I, I have to bring you into this equation because I mean, look at your family. I mm -hmm. was just floored by the history that you shared mm -hmm. at our um, last in-person meeting when you became president. <laughs> um, I mean, it's, inc I mean, you're, you're a yeah. perfect example of a family, an individual and the passion that's put you in where you right. are today. Yeah. Yeah. I feel very blessed to, um, that my dad got into this industry. It's been, uh, it's been a really fun ride and, I'm sure it was ignited by him when I was very young and really hearing about hearing about the industry, hearing about leadership issues and um, going to my first IFT really young mm. was, was big. How just old were you? See, I was probably 12. Oh, wow. And just running around with my sister. And that was back in the days when they'd let kids run around and tasting and going, this is fake crab. Like, I'll never forget that. Like, it was so good. We ate way too much of it. But I'm like, this I still, is I like, still it, do. <laughs> I, I, isn't that amazing? It's so good. Like that makes me proud to be a food scientist of like sometimes yeah. like what, and I've never come up with anything like that, but, but the, just, I think food science is amazing. Yeah. It's just amazing. Yeah. And you know, you, you mentioned students. I mean, there are, there are a lot of students that are in those types of programs. And I think it is beneficial for us to let them know, I mean, they are aware, but make sure that they're fully aware. I think a lot of them aren't, and I, I, I love that. I mean, I think that we could grow the awareness, and like Richard Pisano's, um, you know, and there's just such an in intriguing history of this of this flavor industry. But I think there's a lot more we could do, and I think so. You should touch on what we're doing at Tuskegee a little bit. Yeah, we um, we launched, um, you know, the the the. The flavor industry in general, I mean, it's an incredibly diverse um, um, industry. As I mentioned, walking through um, on these plant tours um, and, and seeing these passionate people, I'm also seeing an incredibly diverse 
group of people. Um, uh, FEMA did launch um, a, a scholarship through Tuskegee, um, which we awarded, um, I believe, this year. Right. Our first. I think that was our first. Yeah. First recipient of uh, the scholarship. Um, Food science major, I believe. Yep, you're yeah. exactly right. Um, and I think that there are definitely opportunities that for us to continue to not only obviously grow uh, the internship, I'm sorry, the scholarship program, but also to um, tap into um, internship programs, yeah. um, to tap into, even if it's virtual, and I say virtual as if that would even if, but virtual um, ways to educate um, the students in the food science program about the flavor industry. Right. And I think it's something that, you know, if it, it could be piloted. When I went to Purdue, you know, I knew about flavors, of course, growing up with a family flavor company. But my, um, I remember my final presentation, my senior presentation, we had to do like, I did a low fat mac and cheese. So we had to do like a full fat and then make it, make the low fat get closer to the full fat, which was like right up my alley. I think I got to pick that obviously. But there was no flavors in our lab at Purdue. Like, that's a problem. And I, I think it's still a problem that I'm mean, now there are there are long flavors at Purdue. <laughs> did you like, did yeah. when you were there? I'm sorry to interrupt because I was oh, interested. Okay. Did you did you tell people about your? Oh, yeah. And I mean, I was they, really close when think? you they're like, we need your samples. We need. Oh, no. I, I mean, when you were a student there, were you telling your other students? Guess, you know, my my dad. No, yeah. no, I don't remember necessarily doing that. Even when I had the internship at Keebler, I didn't share, you know. I did finally with my the woman that ended up being my mentor there, who's still my really good friend. I finally did with her. But you funny enough, you feel funny. Why? Like, well, you don't want to get the job because of it, for one thing. So sure. you never use it, like, for that. But um, I don't know. I wanted to stand on my own two feet. Yeah. Something yeah. around that, maybe. Mm -hmm. But at Purdue, I, I was really close with my counselor, who also was a food science professor. And um, I remember telling her, we need some flavors in here if we're going to do these projects. And so she was like, but it's still, and even the Culinary Institute, I know I've told you, we've got a, a deep relationship with them, too. And they have a culinary science program, which is fairly new, a couple of years old, which is teaching these chefs or these chefs in training how to use flavors, because you're going to not always be a chef at a restaurant. Most of them are going to be chefs at Pepsi, Nestle, where you're mm -hmm. going to be doing commercially viable products that are maybe in the freezer or, you know. Mm -hmm. So they have to learn these these other ways to make, you know, shelf stable or what have you. Mm -hmm. um, so we do a module with them too. But I, so I'm, you know, this is my passion. I feel like that these kids definitely need to become aware of this industry and to learn tools in their toolkit mm -hmm. too. Here we are kind of throwing around, I think, great ideas, things that we are working on. And therein lies another great example of why associations are good, because it, it opens up conversations like this to happen, um, where it's all for the just it's for the better good of, yes. of the industry of young people that may want to get engaged in the in, in different industries. Um, it's it, it, it again, it's an example of creating that um, specific professional community. Yeah, uh, where people I can share these ideas. And again, I think that's one of the one of the bigger benefits of an association because it brings mm -hmm. these people together to share those ideas. Yeah. And it's all positive. It's all goodness that it comes out of it. And if good. and I think that's it's that's that's important and i think again going way back to what i had stated before the that's what that's what drives my passion because mm -hmm. i'm seeing and hearing things from people like yourself um and others in the industry and in, in past associations talking about these things and it's exciting um it's like i almost want to take that that passion and make sure i rub it on myself <laughs> i don't know if that sounds right but like a you lotion. know what I'm trying to say. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that kind of leads us to our last question, George. But I'd love to know the legacy that you'd like to leave behind. That's a hard question. But I thought a lot about it. And I think I, you know, I, there, there were a couple of things that I was thinking about, which is, you know, um, I talked a little bit about, 
you know, where I came from, but, you mm -hmm. know, I was very close with my grandmother and, you know, she had this thing and I'm not now the, the actual phrase and you, hopefully you might know it, but it's like you tracked more bees with honey. Is yes. that the expression? That's, uh, that's it. Yeah. Okay. Um, it, it sort of became this mantra of mine in the sense that, you know, you treat people with respect and kindness and, you know, in m most cases that's returned. And I think that for me, the, the legacy is, and, and I, I, I'd like to think that even today in this conversation, that what I'm em emit emitting is authenticity and, and being authentic. And, you know, when I described my passion for associations, I mean, I wish there was a way you could plug in to, to me to feel mm -hmm. the passion that I, I feel. And, and in many cases, I wish there was a way I could plug into you yeah. <laughs> to feel the passion that you have for, for the company that you've successfully run for so long. Mm -hmm. um, and to me, the, I think, I guess, in the end, to answer your question is just to continue to grow, continue to be uncomfortable, um, not always though. I mean, yeah, it's, it's, nice it's exhausting. To, yeah, right? It's exhausting every day. <laughs> but to be authentic, you know, I think in the end, and and I think that um, I think that's something that I think I, I would hope resonates with with a lot of people. It's the only way to live. It's it's too hard to be anything other. Yeah. It really is. Yeah. It's too much energy. It is. I agree, and I think it's important. I, I'd like to think that by by giving off authenticity that you're getting that authenticity back from, from people so that um, you're only on this planet for so, for such a short amount of time. Right. It's like, let's get to know each other. Exactly. You and know? make a difference. Exactly. So on that note, maybe just one other last little final question is, so what would you like from me in this very short bit of time that I am of service as president of FEMA? I think that, you are doing exactly what you were meant to do. <laughs> I don't feel that I think that th what you're doing is really goes back to what we were describing earlier about joining an association, getting together with your other um, industry colleagues, if you will, and sharing ideas mm -hmm. about ways to, to help people um, you know, you talk about food science students. We're talking about the FEMA Fly program. I think the brainstorming, and you're doing that now. Mm, yeah. Um, you know, and I and I do think there was we never went kind of back to it, and you touched on it, and I loved it. Of this is a historical moment in the FEMA history books. Of so Suzanne, Dr. Suzanne Johnson was president last year of FEMA and handed the torch over to me this past May. And there's this, you know, I'm big and female strong is another one of my passions. And it's the young girls, um, that entrepreneur program. And the saying that we have for female strong is if they can't see it, they can't be it. Mm. And I, I would hope that, that I can be a role model, you know, for some of the, I think you already are. Yeah, I, that, that's I, great. But you know what I mean? Like, and, and then back to the the fly program, whether they're young or old or whatever, but, um, oh, it's not yeah. an age thing. It's, you know, exactly like absolutely. And I know we are going to try to do, um, a little, which I'm excited about, you know, just a women's of the board dinner thing, which feels a little exclusive, but it's okay. Oh yeah. <laughs> I like, mean, we can do that. <laughs> exactly. I mean, I think, I mean, you already are a role model. I mean, look what you're doing, you mm -hmm. know, and that's why people like you, um, specifically stepping back to, you know, working with emerging leaders are it, your story is going to resonate with people mm -hmm. um, because they're newcomers to the industry and you've climbed the mountain, if you mm -hmm. will, you've struggled, it's a, it's you've got, constant. you probably have some scars yeah. and, you know, we're all there, you know, male, female, whatever, we're all there to sort of help each other right you know in any way we can especially and at this phase of our life i feel like this is definitely the give back and the i agree you know help others so so this has been a great conversation george Thank i you. really appreciate you Thank coming you. to town and being here for this special moment and um it's been great to get to know you even more Thank you.